I don't think it's fair to point this, to paint the municipal pension problem as an unfunded state mandate or as a state problem. The issue here is sometimes that benefits were negotiated a long time ago in, in good faith between the police and, and paid firefighters and the local government bodies. And they were maybe negotiated in order to avoid um, a pay increase at the time with the idea that the pension benefit increase would be more easily handled financially. But now, 10, 15 years later, the bill has become due and the rosy actuarial assumptions of the pension plans have not occurred. And we have a situation where some of our municipalities are facing higher and higher pension bills every year that are compromising their ability to do the other things that they're responsible for at the local level. So we're going to explore the problem a little bit before we talk about the two bills that are on the docket. And I think that it's important for us all to realize we do recognize there's a problem. Having said that, however, Pennsylvania has 2,500 local government units. It has very few, relatively speaking, pension plans in distress. Most, two-thirds, most local government units are able to handle their pension obligations as they become due. However, the pension benefits that have been earned must be paid. So we cannot afford to let these pension funds go bankrupt or belly up because the people who have earned the pensions have a right to get them. So just so we understand the problem that we have, it is a problem that's taken 20 or 30 years to develop. It's at our doorstep and we're trying to deal with it now. So the House Local Government Committee and the House Urban Affairs Committee, and by the way, most of the pe distressed pension plans are in urban population centers, um, are trying to deal with this issue, and we appreciate your help. And I also want to thank Upper Marion Township for being so gracious to host this hearing today. You have a very prime location, and we appreciate that you were willing to open your doors so that we could do this hearing here. I'd like to turn the uh, mic over to my um, chairman, uh, Scott Petrie, who's uh, chair of the House Urban Affairs Committee, to open it for his uh, committee as well. Scott? Uh, thank you, Chairman Harper. Uh, this is an issue that the chairman and I have talked about for two years. I was lucky enough to serve on her committee last year and um, we, we were deep into the weeds on this issue. I will tell you, it is a very complex issue. Uh, the more you know about the issues that are intertwined into the negotiation process and also into the process of obtaining a solution, the harder it is to come up with a solution. One of the things I've concluded in my mind is ultimately one size will not fit all. That means that one solution, when a solution that works for a particular distressed municipality may not work for another. I think there's also some facts that we learned. And my committee traveled to Pittsburgh and we learned a lot of interesting, um, we were provided a lot of interesting information uh, to deal with this issue. But some interesting facts that we learned out of that hearing that I think we ought to just have in mind as we go through this testimony. Two thirds of our law enforcement do not have social security. I was astounded by that. I did not know that. It was a deal that was negotiated a number of years ago. Nobody seems to understand exactly why, but that is a fact, and that is an issue to deal with. Of the other officers, there's a cap under federal law on what they can collect with regard to Social Security. So as compared to any other worker, it's about half of what uh, another worker making the same wage, working the same number of years, um, would be able to obtain. The other fact we heard uh, in the Pittsburgh hearing is that one quarter of all pension plans are located in the United States are located in Pennsylvania. So we have a lot of small plans and that becomes an issue. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you, especially on this particular issue. Uh, I want to thank all of the chairman and the members that are here because I think this is an issue that we have to deal with. 
Uh, just as an aside, I had been working uh, very closely with uh, former Representative Glenn Grell, who's now the Executive Director of the PSers, and this is one of the issues that he and I had uh, uh, tried to get our arms around, and that piece of legislation that we're dealing with today and, and the other piece uh, fits in the area that we are trying to see if we could get, uh, oh, get a little closer to get a solution to the problem. Uh, we know what the, the, the dollar amount is, seven to eight billion dollars or somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, part of the, the, the issue, and, and I know this is difficult for some people to understand, but if you extract out Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, we're looking at roughly over two billion dollars for the remainder of those uh, pension funds with the municipal police departments. Uh, we're thinking that at the time that that would be manageable. Somehow we'd have to develop a pot of money to, you know, stabilize that. And my dear friend who is now filling in for Glenn, uh, Representative Delosier, <coughs> her and I have been consulting now on that very issue to see just what is reasonable, what can be done, and hopefully with this hearing and the testimony, it might give us some direction. Vice Chairman Bill Genoway, Mayor of City of Easton, Sal Panto, and uh, Commissioner Don Warner from Upper Moreland. Bill Genoway is from Upper Murray, and thanks again for having us. If you guys could come up. My name is Bill Genoway. I am the Vice Chairman of Upper Marion Township's Board of Supervisors. The Township is pleased to host this important meeting on statewide municipal pension reform. On behalf of our chairperson, Erica Spott, my fellow board members, and our township manager, Dave Cranick, welcome to Upper Marion. We are a full-service municipality with over 175 full-time employees. We boast a well-trained and very professional police department, I would say it's the best in the state, of 65 sworn officers. We offer second-to-none library and parks and recreation programs and services. We have three outstanding volunteer fire companies and one ambulance squad. And like most municipalities in the Commonwealth, we fund our municipal pension programs with state monies and local property tax revenues. In 2015, we placed over $1.3 million, or 4.2% of our operating budget, into those plans. Upper Marion's pension plans are approximately 90% funded, and we work hard to make that happen and sustain that through our pension advisory board and the Board of Supervisors oversight. However, it is getting more and more difficult each year. In fact, our MMO, our minimum municipal obligation, will be going up over $400,000 in 2016. We are looking at that as a Board of Supervisors and have in place a thought process and plan that will be able to deal with that without adverse impact to the community. Good planning. We understand that larger municipalities, namely the cities in Pennsylvania, are struggling to fund their pension plans and are not nearly as well funded. And we appreciate the fact that they need help. But my main message this morning is that whatever is done to bolster failing and weak pension plans, that strong plans like that in Upper Marion are not hurt in the process. It's imperative that any state measures that are passed do not take away funding from local municipalities and weaken them as a result. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having this hearing here. And please enjoy your stay in King of Prussia. Thank you very much. Don? Thank you. Okay. I'm Donald Warner. I'm Township Commissioner for Upper Moreland. And uh, Upper Moreland is, uh, we were considered a first suburb just outside of Philadelphia. We consider ourselves a hub of, uh, of um, Montgomery County. We're 611 and 263 cross. We have the turnpike and we also have a uh, rail connection there. Uh, we have been a township that has been in further problems. We are in better shape today than we, are, than we have been, uh, but I'll, I'll go into that. Upper Moreland maintains three pension plans, police, firefighters, and non-uniformed employees. Um, in 2015, township's pension, pension costs for all three pension plans was $2,290,000, or 11.7% of our overall budget. Uh, the township's general budget is, is a little over $19.5 in uh, 2015 alone, pension costs for township plans have increased $601,898. That is a huge amount of money for a township of our size to, uh, to um, absorb. That, was, that would be about 9% of all real estate taxes. 
Upper Moreland Township has always funded 100% of its required contributions to its pension plan. Even so, the township's pension plan still has an unfunded liability of $7.5 million, or 73% funding level. That, again, was up from in the mid-upper 60s just a few years ago. We've been working very diligently at trying to, to do this, but it is difficult. State aid for our township pension plans has only increased 51,577 since, since 2007, while at the same time pension costs have increased 1,670,000, resulting in an additional funding burden to the township of $1,618,000. With state aid flat and investment earnings not as big as a source of funding as they had been in the past, mandatory pension funding requirements have a direct and detrimental impact on the township's budget and financial stability. The Board of Commissioners is faced with the difficult decision of how to offset spiraling pension costs with alternatives such as large real estate tax increases, postponement of capital equipment purchases, delaying capital projects, and even employee layoffs. The township's independent auditors have expressed their concern that the current level of pension funding is unsustainable. Without pension reform, at some point, Upper Moreland Township will not be able to afford to continue providing the municipal services that the, at the current level that re residents have come to expect. In 2016, the township pensions cost will now be $2.3 million, up from $1.67. Uh, some notes that I had also made to myself is, is that uh, I, am, I sit on the Police Pension Fund Committee. Uh, we have been outperforming the market, but that's not uh, really a great consolation because the market hasn't been anything much to outperform. Uh, it's difficult to do, but you're not getting a lot of return for your, for your work. Um, we, we also have situations with the negotiations as we go that it's difficult. Uh, I understand that I inherited this. I've only been on the board three years. So, you know, all of us that are on the board now have, none of us have been there more than six. So, Obviously, in earlier times when market interest rates and all were very high, it was a little bit easier to kind of manage through negotiations, but now it's time to pay the piper. And we're in a very difficult spot. We try to negotiate things going forward. It's very difficult, uh, frankly, because, and I'll, I'll be honest, I have no malice towards the police. I love the police. But when we get into negotiations, it's a very one-sided attempt. They, uh, four years ago, there was nary a, a negotiation, and they immediately took us to uh, binding arbitration. And it seems that over the years, the arbitrators have been much more sympathetic to, uh, to the police than they have been to the residents. In one case, four years ago, there was a negotiated item that was out three years prior that the arbitrator put back in. So uh, there's just, you know, issues like that going forward is going to make it very difficult to try and curtail this. Um, we have the Cadillac tax issue coming up soon. We tried to negotiate something to try and work towards that, and we were completely stalled. Uh, so, again, I guess you could claim that we took that issue and kicked the can forward another three years, even though there was an attempt. So, at this point now, I really see that um, because of the, the turnover in the local communities, uh, the differences of opinions, um, between different uh, commissioners or supervisors or whatever are there, um, I really think that the state needs to lay in and put some sort of an overlay to manage this. And with due respect to my, my colleague here in Upper Marion, and I understand they're at 90 percent plus in their funding, there needs to come out to be some sort of a formula that puts everybody together and puts everybody on the same plane based run from the state. And that would be the next best thing to just the state taking over the police, but, you know, or the regional. But that would be my opinion. I've looked at this from, from all sides. I, I'm on the budget committee. I'm on finance. I'm on the police pension fund. There's really no way to get out of this without some sort of legislative move from the higher ups to make adjustments to what we need to do to the future. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sal Panto. I'm the mayor of the city of Easton. I have the uh, Pleasure of also serving on the Board of Trustees for the um, Pen, uh, PMRS, Pennsylvania Municipal Retirement System. So I come from a number of different perspectives. But the biggest perspective I bring is I was mayor of Easton from 1984 to 1992, all through the debate of Act 205, et cetera. And then I came back in 2008. 
When I came in in 2008, we completely revamped our investors. Our fee schedule is now a third of what it was back then. And we've determined that, you know, we, no matter how much money we put into our pension plan, it continues to grow the unfunded liability. Even with the investments coming up a little bit better than they were back in the crash, we're doing better with investments, but the number of employees paying in is much less than the employees who are receiving the benefits. So there's a, there's a, there's a counterbalance. The drop program that you've allowed, uh, arbitration allowed going into, that takes that money, that large sum of money right out of the corpus. So it increases our municipal mandatory obligation and it also decreases our amount of money we can put into our investments. So yes, the firefighter who has a drop may be able to put their own money in, but we lose that money as what our actuarial determined was going to be there forever, and now it's not. So there's a number of things I think the state does have a lot of play on what our pension plans are, and oftentimes we do get blamed for the unfunded liability. Our unfunded liability when I left office in 1992 was $24 million. What 205 said then was that the state was going to put in a million dollars, and we were going to put in an extra million dollars, and in 15 years we'd be, we'd be sound. Well, the good news was that in 1972, the city of Easton passed an ordinance, which it can do at that time, that said all new employees, all new hires were in PMRS. Somewhere in the mid-90s, a state arbitrator put police and fire back into the city unfunded mandates, unfunded liability pension plans that were already unfunded by 24 million, and now they go, it grows. It doesn't get less, it, goes, it gets to be more. Then an arbitrator gives 70%, of the last three years instead of 50%, and pretty soon it just compounds the amount of losses that we were receiving. We believe that we've controlled it as much as we can, and it's still not gonna go down. It's still gonna be a restraint. When I came into office in 2008, our minimum mandatory obligation was $600,000 roughly. Today it's six million. Um, and that money is coming right out of the right out of the taxpayers. It's coming right out of important projects. Is, is that a function of the age of your officers or the? Well, it's a function of the fact that we had an early retirement, okay. so there's more young people, and it had to do with the mortality tables that we've decided we were going to do, which actuarially sound and say that no, people don't die at 65 or 70; they die at 83, mm. and that's the average age of a, of, a, of a male at the time because right now all of our male. The only people we have in our retirement system for police and fire is males. So we've actually, we've, we brought our, actual, our, our actuary up to a, a legitimate mortality table rather than trying to say, oh, we're 90% funded. No, we're not 90% funded. We're about 70% funded because we were basing it on the wrong mortality rate. So there's a lot of ways you play games. What we've decided in 2008 to do was to make sure that everything we do was fiscally sound. And if it meant telling the public that we're not as wealthy as we said we were, it meant doing that. But the one thing we don't do, and I don't know that very many townships or boroughs or cities do, is kick the can down the road anymore. We don't do that. We fund what we have to fund today. Because, j j for example, we're, we're, we're dedicating a brand new city hall on October 25th. It's a $34 million intermodal city hall project. It's a huge project. It's a 15-year bond issue. Not a 30 a 15. I think it's very important that the state get involved in not only helping us change the benefit package and change the way of new hires. I, I get so upset when I, when I, when I have to deal with, with the unions. I'm a union guy. I'm a former teacher, okay? So it has nothing to do with union. It has to do with how much sustainability does a municipality in Pennsylvania have? That's the only issue I have. In my mind, if we don't stop it for new hires, we are going to get worse and worse and worse. We believe, the FOP, that uh, municipal pensions are basically in good shape in Pennsylvania. The fact in Pennsylvania is that defined pensions work. If managed correctly and conservatively, if operated with the involvement of all stakeholders, including police, defined benefit pension plans work. We know the overwhelming majority of Pennsylvania's municipal pension plans are very well funded. Again, based on Perk's report, 23 municipalities representing 1.6% of the total are severely distressed. But just because our plans are in good shape doesn't mean that there's not room for improvement. We think the improvement that needs to be addressed is a statewide system and actually, my personal belief is it should be for 
all municipal plans, not just police. I mean, 3,200 plans statewide are being operated. 25% of all municipal pension plans in the United States are here in Pennsylvania. According to PERC, and I'm just going to speak on the police plans, according to PERC, Pennsylvania currently has 956 municipal police pension plans. Of these plans, 352 have three or fewer active members. Three or fewer. 305 have from four to ten, and nearly 70% of all municipal pension plans have less than 11 active members, less than 11. And all of these plans must hire an actuary, an accountant, an attorney, an investment advisor, a custodian of the funds. The administrative costs are really staggering when you look at them because we have so many individual plans. <clears throat> The costs associated with the administrative and investment expense of these numerous plans are significantly greater than for a multi-employer retirement system like PMRS. A PERC review of the 2013 Act 205 reporting data revealed the average per member administrative cost for Pennsylvania municipal police pension plans, excluding Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, were $1,612 while the average per member administrative cost under PMRS was $392. $392 versus $1,612. The same review found the average per member cost for investments for local municipal police plans was $1,590 compared to PMRS's per member cost of $762. That would be a total administrative cost paid by plans currently at 15.8 million and investments of 15.5. This is a big number. And we believe this is what has to be addressed. House Bill 32 provides a modest defined benefit plan that features higher employee contributions, minimum employer funding requirements, and more conservative management practices. The statewide plan would mandate, be mandated for new officers and optional for current police departments. To protect against local abuses and outlier benefit levels, the statewide plan completely prohibits local bargaining over pension plans for members in that plan. The bill would also foster the gradual consolidation of Pennsylvania's 900 plus police pension plans in order to secure savings, encourage regionalization of police services and remove unnecessary labor market restrictions that limit departments' abilities to recruit new officers from competing police departments. And some House Bill 32 provides a modest and cost-effective benefit for Pennsylvania's police officers. My name is Art Marty Nuska. I'm president of the Pennsylvania Professional Firefighter Association. Uh, some of the things that, 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 the we, that we were talking about as far as ideas or creativeness is uh, we have very few joint trustee pension plans in the Commonwealth. I, I know of two. I just did a recent survey of our municipalities and uh, of all the respondents that came back, there was only two that identified that they had a true joint trustee pension plan, meaning that there's equal representation. In most cases, uh, it, it's, it's a couple firefighters and, uh, uh, and, and more of a majority of municipal officials who sit on those panels. One of the reasons we espouse a joint trustee pension plan is that would give ownership. That would give ownership to the people who are involved in the pension fund to make good fiduciary decisions and share the responsibility. Uh, there had been some talk and some legislation about risk sharing, and certainly the idea or the concept of risk sharing is not lost on us, but in the same vein, we want to be able to share in the decision making if we're going to share the risk in that, in that, in that venue. If we're going to make decisions that may encounter that our folks have to pay more money, then we would like to see equal representation on those boards. In addition, better control over administration fees. We've heard some testimony already uh, about administration fees, and once again, I have, to, I have to reverse course to the city of Johnstown, and one of the things that, that unfortunately we discovered in the city of Johnstown is that there was exorbitant administration fees by administration being charged against the pension fund. 
Uh, the panel may or may not be aware that you're allowed to charge an hour for hour fee on work done for the pension fund. And what we stumbled upon and has since been quelled by the uh, Auditor General, at that time they were charging, I understand there's a staff of three folks in the finance office in the city of Johnstown, they were charging $34,000 against the fire pension, $28,000 or $26,000 against the police pension, $22,000 against non-uniform, and in the high teens against the, uh, the sewage workers pension fund. So for all intents and purposes, our pension fund was funding the entire operations of all three staff members in the finance office. Uh, you can have a person work 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, and not absorb that type of cost in administration fees. That has since been, that has since been, uh, has been stopped. But one of the other things that we talk about, of course, is the state aid formulary. And I believe the numbers were just published um, a week or so ago that the, the new state aid this, this year is $3,900 and some change. And for each uh, police officer and firefighter, we get two of those unit values and non-uniform uh, gets one. The next part of the, that I want to say is probably based on a, more of an assumption. Um, most non-uniform that, that I have come in contact with do pay into Social Security. And as, as an aside, uh, with the city of Johnstown again, what happens with our non-uniform pension funds, and they're in the best shape uh, financially as funded as funder ratio goes, is when they start to receive Social Security, because they do pay into it, their municipal pension fund drops in accordance to what they're receiving from Social Security. So that's actually a savings uh, per se. But with that being said, the state aid or the unit value as, as these municipalities have contracted and we see more retirees than we do active employees, one of our proposals is to adjust that state aid formulary and make it that we get one unit value for every retiree. Now that doesn't necessarily need to be statewide. It could be limited to those municipalities that are, that are upside down in the number of pensioners that they have versus the number of active and also, also that you know, meet a certain distress level for their, for their funded ratio. And, and, and an example that I'll give um, that comes off of the, once again, the city of Johnstown, where we have 33 active, we probably have about 77, 78 retirees. Uh, a more draconian uh, example would be the, uh, the city of Pittsburgh. The city of Pittsburgh has 619 sworn firefighters and over 1,100 retirees. So uh, that, that formulary may be, may be put forth. Uh, the last thing that, that, that's been discussed um, uh, in, in the Commonwealth, not only from the career side of the House, but also from the volunteer firefighter side of the House, is an adjustment to the formulary and how much state aid is, is, is garnered um, from the insurance fund. Uh, there's been some talk, I know, to raise that a percentage to 3%, and in rough numbers, uh, that would generate about $125 million more per year on top of the fund. I do think we aired it out. I think we understand we got a problem. I think we have a few solutions on the table and we'll continue to vet them and talk to each other about what would work. I think the legislature wants to do right by its local governments, but also wants to do right by its emergency firefighters who protect us and wear the thin blue line between us and chaos. So uh, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it.